Tuesday, September 8th, I believe. This is Senate Government Operations. And um, we are, what we're looking at committee is, um, and people who are might be watching, is <clears throat> lessons learned from the, from the uh, COVID-19 and how we apply those lessons to areas within our jurisdiction and some that aren't in our jurisdiction that have thrown it to us. But um, so that we will not find ourselves having to scramble should we have an emergency or some kind of a, an event um, in the future. So with that, um, and we are hoping to have the vote this bill out on Thursday, because if we want to get it to the um, House and have them have any time with it and then make any changes or add anything, um, we need to, because we have two weeks left. Am I right about that? Is that what we figure? Oh, three. three. So, yes, this is the beginning of three weeks that we have left. Three weeks, yeah. So if we get it out on two on Thursday, that leaves two weeks for for everything else that needs to be done to it. So with that, I think um, so far we've looked at uh, open meetings, posting of meetings. Tucker has been walking us through them. Betsy has walked us through a lot of um, stuff with OPR and the medical board and some other issues. So who would like to um, start here? Well, I can start. I want to tell Ms. Rask, I, I found the bill and I read it and your language is much better than what we sent you. So, oh, <laughs> that's almost always true. Right. And I didn't know there would be a sunset. So yeah, I, I've read it and we're fine with it. Okay, so that, that is the, for people who aren't aware that that is the section that deals with um, the ability of sheriffs to access um, emergency community, emergency county funds in the case of some kind of an emergency. And they'd have to work with the side judges to do that. And I guess you worked with Sheriff Boniak on yes. that. And I so said, you're okay. Yeah. I sent him the same language and yeah. he said it was fine. Uh, and I, I assume they don't think the, the, the redraft is fine as well. And, and Jack, I hate to ask you this, but as the clerk, I have to. Would you be kind enough to identify yourself? Sure. I'm Assistant Judge Jack Anderson, Windsor County. Okay, so I think that is does is everybody on the committee okay with that that section so that we can just sure. cross that one off? Yep. All right. Yeah. Good. To be clear, Senator, these are reserve funds that were statutorily allowed to have uh, mm -hmm. just in case, and there are, there are caps set by statute as to how much money we can have, what percentage of the budget, and that that sort of thing. So it it seems to be a continuation of what we did for COVID. And I didn't know it would be a county uh, emergency. I thought it would have been a statewide emergency. So that's that's cleared up for me. Betsy Ann. Yeah, uh, hello, Betsy Ann Rass, Legislative Council. Do uh, committee members just wanna look at where that language is? Yeah, I was trying to find a what page in 15, is it? Last page. Okay, so this is on page, starts on page 13. Um, ah. So yeah. Tucker and I, 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 I understand the committee will want to have one bill just because of our schedules right now we have two separate drafts and the one that I put together covers local elections professional regulation and the emergency emergency sheriff funding. And so this sheriff language is on section 13 starting on page 13. And it just takes the language that you already enacted for, it was Act 100 that addresses the emergency public safety issues and converted it into a permanent statutory provision that could be used off the shelf in case um, there is a future state of emergency that would impact the sheriff's department. And so the language there on line 15 starts out by saying during a state of emergency declared within a county under 20 VSA chapter one, which is the governor's emergency management chapter. Um, so it's focused on, it, it could be just an emergency within a county. Um, for example, some of our weather related emergencies like Tropical Storm Irene could have impacted one county more than the other. Um, 
So it provides that in order to support the emergency needs of sheriffs due to that emergency, a county's operations reserve funds and capital reserve funds can be allowed to be used for the emergency needs of the sheriff subject to the approval of the assistant judges. So it's thereafter set up very similarly to what you did for Act 100, but makes it more generally about emergencies within the um, county rather than COVID specifically. There's still on page 14, that requirement for the sheriff to seek any allowable reimbursement. And then in subsection C, if you wanna keep it, um, there was that sunset in Act 100 for how long the sheriff's authority to use those county reserve funds lasted. In Act 100, it was two, there was a sunset on this authority for two weeks after the state of emergency was terminated. And so I retain that here, if you want to do that, to, to say that the authority for a sheriff to obtain funding for emergency needs under sub A sunsets two weeks after the day the governor terminates the emergency. And I think that sunset, that two week period was what was agreed upon by the um, side judges and the, and the sheriffs. Um, sheriffs. So I think I don't have any problem leaving it there for this. Committee members, are fine you okay with it? Yeah, sure. fine by me. Okay, all right. Okay, great. I will, uh, I'll, I'll send a copy of this to the sheriff if you, if you haven't already, to Sheriff Poignac. Okay. Okay. Chris, Thank Chris you. Yeah, Chris, did you have a question? You're on mute. You're Chris. muted. You're muted. I'm happy as often. Um, and, and I'm happy to wait till you're finished with this section. I was just trying to raise my hand as we go on to the next topic. Oh, oh okay, yeah. Let's finish this topic first, Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make sure, is Sheriff Boniak going to speak on behalf of all the sheriffs? Yes, he's the president of the Vermont okay. Sheriff Association. Great, thank you. Sure. And, and uh, Allison? Jeff, Thank you, Jeanette. Would you be kind enough to remind us how many, do you know how many counties, how many sheriff's departments, I believe only one sheriff's department actually used this opportunity so far. I mean, obviously we're still in a state, uh, a declared state of emergency, so it's possible other sheriffs, but to date only one sheriff's department has used it. Is that correct? As far as I know, yes. I, I put out an email to all my judges and said, please, if you if your sheriff has taken advantage of this, please let me know. And I heard from Wyndham. And before this bill was passed, the side judges in Orleans uh, had appropriated some money to the sheriff for PPE. Other than that, I haven't heard anything. Okay. okay, so are we all okay with this section? Okay. Yes. Yes. Put a big red okay on this one and we're done with it. Thank you for letting me go first and have a great day. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye now. All right. So as long as people have uh, that draft up, let's go. Let's continue with that. Is that okay with you, Tucker and Betsy Ann? Okay. Sure. So let's go to Chris. Yeah. So just the um, in terms of the press, uh, the I emailed a link to the current bill to John Flowers and Mike Donahue, who, were, who I'd heard from, and um, suggested that they contact the committee if interested as soon as possible, perhaps even trying to connect with Gail today if, um, if the meeting allows them to come in. I don't know how full our agenda is. So- Well, the, we're, we're just gonna be working on this all day. Right, well, I just want you to know the, the, the ball is explicitly in their court and They've got the bill, so that's that. Thank you. Do they have both both of them? Oh well, they only care about this. They only the need this. They only need this section. I mean, this piece. The other, the other one. They need Tucker's. Oh, I thought. Oh, right. This is no Betsy. Betsy and the municipal elections and sheriffs and OPR. So right. let's that's go good. on to municipal elections because we have both Chris and um, Karen with us. I don't know if anybody else is there or not. I can't. 
can only see a few people on my screen. So, when Betsy Ann, would you like to? Hmm? Gwen is as well. Oh, okay. I did not see that. Thank you. Betsy Ann, would you like to? Sure. So if you want to go back up, still on the same draft, the 3.1, um, the bill draft would start with the local elections. And um, thank you to VLCT and the Secretary of State's office for um, working with me on this. As I understood from your last meeting, um, you as a committee did not want to address primary or general elections in this draft. So this would focus focus on local elections. Mm -hmm. And after um, I ha heard some feedback from VLCT, it's my understanding the two main things that VLCT would like to do is to have authority to move the date and time of a local election and then to allow for uh, applying the Australian ballot system um, to a future meeting by the legislative body. So that's what these two sections would address. Um, and so the language starts off by saying, um, and I'll only just say it needs to have a technical correction here. Right now it says notwithstanding the provisions of 2643 and 26, 2641 and 2643, that should actually be 2640 not 2641. Um, what I was notwithstanding there is 20, a 17 VSA 2640, which sets in statute the date of every town's annual meeting. So that, just make a note of that. So it would re read, notwithstanding provisions of sections 2640 and 2643, 2643 being a requirement to hold a special meeting um, or any other provisions of law to the contrary, because there could be uh, municipal charters that could address special meetings or otherwise annual meetings. This language would go on to say, during a state of emergency declared within a municipality under the emergency management chapter, because it could be just a, an emergency focused on a specific municipality, not statewide. The municipality's legislative body may move the time and date of the municipality's upcoming annual or special meeting if the legislative body determines that the circumstances of the state of emergency may harm the public health, safety, or welfare if the meeting is held at its scheduled time and date. And if it makes such a determination, um, the body shall schedule a new time and date for the meeting so that it's held as soon as practicable and warn the meeting accordingly. This is a very tentative first draft of language, um, but it would just focus on moving time and date. It did not seem necessary to discuss moving any locations because there's already separate authority in 17 BSA 2502 that allows a uh, municipality to change the location of a polling place in cases of emergency. So it did not seem necessary to address locations, but more time and place um, moving. So that's a first draft. I don't know if you wanna take it one at a time, Madam Chair. If we yeah, let, to... let's okay. do that. Let's look at this, this section and see if there are any comments, Karen, and then committee members, would you? Yeah, Karen Horn here, uh, and I I think that this section looks good to us. Um, the emergency declared within a municipality under 20 VSA Chapter 1, this, this is more a question than a statement. That is that the governor would be declaring the emergency, but just for the particular municipalities that are affected. The, the governor under that chapter has the authority to declare state of emergency statewide or in portions of the state. So okay. I just use that language within a municipality with the understanding that it would mean that if, you know, if there's only a certain part of the state that had a, for which the state of emergency applied, then that language should cover the municipality. But I'm definitely happy, open to suggestions on revisions and I'm not sure Tucker and I should be careful too that we're using the same language and so that's another thing that we can do to make sure that the whole bill is um, is consistent in that way 
<clears throat> Chris, did you have any comments? Uh, Chris um, Winters. Sure. Th thank and you. And then Chris Bray. Chris Winters, Deputy Secretary of State for the record. Um, unfortunately, I haven't had a lot of time to, to get in front of uh, Will Senning today to take a look at this draft, but uh, some general impressions that, that we've had. I know you were considering some kind of check and balance on these um, authorities and, and thought maybe the Secretary of State's office would, or some um, combination of Secretary of State, VLCT, VMCTA were uh, possibly appropriate. But I think, um, you know, just as you've entrusted the Secretary of State's office on temporary election procedures, uh, I think you're talking about a declared state of emergency. You're talking about the legislative body for the town. Um, and you're talking about a very specific set of circumstances. There's always the potential for abuse, but I, I don't see that risk as great as compared to the risk of not having a temporary procedure authority in, in the case of a declared state of emergency. So. We don't see the need for us to be a, a part of that decision and um, think that this authority is probably very, very much appropriate under a declared state of emergency. And, and I will get to, to Secretary Condos and, and Director Senning on this language um, sometime later today and, and probably uh, definitely by tomorrow and, and to see if they have any additional concerns, I'd relay those back to the committee. Thank you. Committee? Anybody want to comment or have a concern or a question or comment? No, I had, I, I had had a question about the location, but Betsy already answered that. Okay, Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just, I'm trying to think ahead, um, like the worst possible situation. There are no guardrails on the temporal provision. So, the local legislative body could put it off as long as they determine. I mean, it could be a year. Although I think Karen pointed out correctly, if it has to do with the budget, I mean, at some point you got to pass a budget in the town or you can't really continue to operate. But I don't, and I don't know that there's anything bad about not having guardrails on it. It's just an observation that there aren't any. And I'm wondering whether that could present a problem. Karen, do you want to comment on that? Well, our, our comment would, uh, I don't really know how you would put guardrails around it, thinking ahead and what those particular circumstances might be around an emergency. So um, we, were, we were thinking that sort of the automatic control would be the need to adopt a budget and that um, you do have language here that talks about scheduling a new time and date that so that it is held as soon as practicable um, and warn the meeting accordingly. I mean, you're not going to be able to go very long without having such a meeting with, um, and if you do, your electorate is going to be very unhappy with you. So that's the other consideration. Okay, thank you. Chris Bray, did you have a question? Uh, I did not, thank you very much. Oh, okay. So is everybody okay with the kind of concept of this and just working out any detailed language? And, and we'll hear from Will Senning and Jim Condos. Yep. Okay, and the clerks, did the clerks um, weigh in on this at all? because they're the ones that kind of run the elections. My bad, I didn't ask the clerks. I can send it to them now. Okay. But it is the legislative body that would make the decision. Yeah, not, but yeah. I, I can, I will send this to Carol Dawes. Okay. Right now, actually, I think. Okay. All right, do we want to go on to the uh, Australian ballot um, section? So that's section two that begins on line eight of page two. And so big picture, this would uh, allow a legislative body to vote to apply the Australian ballot system to upcoming municipal elections. Instead of the current law requirement that requires the voters of a municipality to get together to first vote together 
as to whether to apply the Australian ballot system to its future elections. So this, and this was again taken from your first GovOps COVID response bill that included this similar authority for uh, moving to Australian ballot um, by a vote of the legislative body. So I'll start out by saying notwithstanding the provisions of subsection 2680A, which describes that Australian ballot, the current loss Australian ballot system, um, that require the voters of a municipality to vote to apply the provisions of the Australian ballot system to the annual or special meeting of a municipality during a state of emergency declared within the municipality under 20 VSA chapter one, the legislative body may vote to apply the Australian ballot system to an upcoming annual or special meeting, not less than 60 days in advance of that meeting, if the legislative body determines that it is necessary to do so in order to protect the public health, safety, or welfare due to the circumstances of the state of emergency. So it would allow the legislative body to do this. Um, speaking with VLCT, as I understand it, that, that 60 day window is to um, the not less than 60 days in advance of that meeting is so that they can go through the steps necessary to prepare for the Australian ballot system in advance of the meeting. And there's that qualifier that the legislative body can only do this if it determines it's necessary to protect the public due to the circumstances of the state of emergency. I went on and kept that subsection B. Um, this is allowing for the waiver of statutory or charter or school district articles of agreement um, provisions that would otherwise apply to um, in moving to Australian ballot. You had language like this in your first GovOps bill, but it was about the Secretary of State being able to waive statutory provisions to allow a legislative body to move to Aust uh, Australian ballot. So with the understanding that the Secretary of State would not be involved in this and there would be a decision of the legislative body due to the specific circumstances, this language would provide that a legislative body that uses that authority in subsection A shall not be subject to any statutory deadlines or other statutory provisions or provisions in a school district's articles of agreement related to the municipal meeting that conflict with the need to apply the Australian ballot system to the meeting to the extent necessary to enable the municipality to apply Australian ballot system to that meeting. I'm just wondering if this is necessary, if you've got that 60 day window built into subsection A and whether there would be any deadlines that would need to essentially be waived to allow the um, Muni to uh, apply the Australian ballot system to that meeting. It's just, it seems perhaps with the 60 day build out in subsection A that there wouldn't be any other lingering deadlines that the municipality would have to comply with, but it just, it's, I'm, I wasn't sure of the answer. So I left that in for now, thinking that maybe the Secretary of State's office and VLCT can give feedback as to whether there might be statutory deadlines outside of the 60 day window that a legislative body would have to comply with. I just don't know Karen? the answer offhand. Karen? Um, I don't know the answer offhand either. I don't think there are, but I'll, I'll have to double check. Okay. And Chris, you'll check too? Yeah, same here. I can't think of any, but that's a great Will sending question. Okay. <clears throat> so the does this also apply, give that authority to school boards as their legislative body? Yes, I read this because a uh, school district is a municipality and okay. it's using that general language municipality and legislative body. Okay, I want to run by um, Senator Baruth just to check in with him. So is it, does anybody have any concerns or questions about this section, Allison? Are there 
the school board, but are there other municipal le legislative bodies? Are, are some fire departments, I mean, are there other ones that we're not thinking of that are also legislative bodies? Mm -hmm. Well, there are prudential committees and um, for fire districts and village right. trustees. Um, and uh, well, you could go right down the rabbit hole of all the different kinds of municipalities, but those are the main ones. And I think that this committee actually deals with most of those except school boards, which is why I wanna run the school board one by Senator Baruth. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you'll check on that. But other than that, we're okay with getting that clarified that um, B, we're okay with this language. Okay. All right. So do you want to move on to OPR? I could, Madam Chair, I don't, um, what works for the committee? I just have that, uh, I'm supposed to be in House Approps briefly at two, and we've got BLC and Tec Secretary of State's office here. I wonder, does it make sense to flip over to, are there municipal provisions that you still want to review with Tucker? Oh, good. That might relate sure. to open meeting or? Sure. Idea. Yep, that's fine. That's and Gail, just for your information, if if uh, John Flowers or Mike Donahue or somebody who identifies themselves as members of the press asked to be led into the meeting, would you just let them in? Okay, Tucker. Okay, so I have two new sections for you that have been added to the municipal provisions that you have been looking at and one change that you requested last week. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen here if I can. It, is it possible for Gail to post that? It, it is posted. posted. Oh, great. Thanks. I will you refresh. You also have it by email. Okay. Okay. But it's right here on our website. Yippee. So I can't quite uh, share it for you yet, but I'll just walk slowly through it on my own screen here. So uh, the first change is right off the bat in that section X on page one, one VSA section 312A, uh, you had asked for a particular trigger to be put in here for when a public body is considered an affected public body that can take advantage of the uh, open meeting uh, powers that you're putting in here. So in subdivision A1, in the definition of affected public body, I broke up the two requirements. Subdivision capital A contains the language that you saw in the last draft, and this is the first requirement. That's that the regular meeting location is located in an area affected by a hazard. And again, we looked at the definition of hazard. You can always narrow that, but for now, uh, this is a portion of the state where the governor has identified a hazard exists and there's a declared public emergency or state of emergency, excuse me. Subdivision B is the new language. This is the second requirement. The affected public body is a public body that cannot meet in a designated physical lo meeting location due to a declared state of emergency. So this is what you were asking for, where it's not just that the regular meeting location is in an area affected by the hazard, it's that they can't meet in that area. They can't meet at all. They can't designate a physical meeting location. And this is uh, perhaps broad enough that it would capture emergencies like COVID-19, where you have to remain distant. You can't hold a meeting that large to get everyone in the town in the same place or everyone who wants to attend a particular meeting in the same place. And it could address other emergencies where perhaps as Senator White brought up, uh, the town has experienced some sort of chemical spill or radiological disaster where people can't leave their homes. Are there any questions about that? Questions, comments? Nope. I think those virtual backgrounds are so funny because 
Chris just stood up and it ended up looked like like he was um some kind of a blight spirit. It's like a ghost <laughs> following him, his shadow. Peter Pan is really, you know, it's kind of Peter Pan-esque. Yeah. <laughs> I so did anybody have any questions or comments or concerns about that section? No, I think that's a good addition, Tucker. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Moving on. The new section, first new section that you'll take a look at uh, is on page six, and this is in section X, Y. And uh, this contains the language that you worked on around water and wastewater disconnections during a state of emergency. Oh, right. So this would add a new section to the chapter in Title 24 that deals with the uniform water disconnect rules. And this new section, again, contains the same language that you passed, but would be added in and it would be triggered by a declared state of emergency. Uh, so as you'll recall, the reason that this is so long is that there are multiple types of providers. There are municipal water and wastewater service providers, and then there are licensed and permitted uh, utility providers that are regulated by the PUC. Um, so that's why there are multiple subsections, but effectively what this does is that during a declared state of emergency, there would be a moratorium on disconnections from this service. I have highlighted that general language that you've been using all along that just says during a declared state of emergency under you know, 20 VSA chapter one. Uh, I've highlighted that because there may be certain declared states of emergency uh, that you want to exclude. And uh, the discussion that came up around the time that this was proposed was that we were dealing with a state of emergency where people were effectively sheltering in place and that disconnections from water and wastewater services would be a pretty dramatic step to take for people who are in their homes all day. So I didn't know if the committee wanted to have a discussion around if this is going to be codified and you know, somewhat permanently effective, uh, what types of emergencies would trigger this moratorium on the water disconnections? Hmm. Any thoughts on that, Chris? Well, I'm just th thinking a lot. I mean, there's like one scenario could be um, think about Bennington where the public water supply had PFAS in it. And in some right. cases, uh, well, actually, no, sorry. Let me stop, misspoke there. It's the public water supply that didn't. It was their, their private water supplies that did. But there are systems smaller than full municipal systems. Um, I'm just thinking about what happens, let me back up a step. What happens if you have a public water supply that there is a problem, somehow it turned out, the chemical of concern that Senator White was talking about got into that water supply and you, I don't know that it'd be a disconnect, you know, but you might want to not distribute that water to everyone and sort of shut down the system. So is shutting it down, uh, uh, you know, a quote unquote disconnect. I don't know. I'm just thinking about it could go either way. You'd want to not let something bad get to people or you could want to um, or you people might need the service. You're really just protecting them from an inability to pay their bill. Mm -hmm. um, if I may, can, yes. this is Karen Horn. So regarding the, the issue of contaminants in the water supply, there's a whole host of Agency of Natural Resources and Department of Health regulations around that, um, boil water notices and those kinds of things. Um, and down in Bennington, if you recall, they actually distributed bottled water and brought in tanks. So I think on the side of contamination, um, that's taken care of in other statutes. And it, it seems to me that the, that the real issue is um, you know, when do you want to prohibit disconnections and, and when do you want um, people to have an obligation to pay their bill? So maybe you can say um, can't be disconnected for non-payment during the time of the emergency, but that it doesn't um, unobligate people from the, from the debt. I, I don't know if you can do that or not. 
Yes, that's what that's what's been effectively done in many circumstances in terms of foreclosures and rent and mm -hmm. rent assistance, uh, it, which is one of the challenges we face is that then they have this huge debt at the end, which we're dealing with. I mean, obviously, that's part of what the assistance is for is for the landlords is to wipe out that whole debt ahead of time. I mean, that's that's accrued. Well, the, the other thing that towns will do is, um, you know, meet with a customer or a um, taxpayer and come up with a schedule for payment. Mm -hmm. So you're not liable for the whole nine yards all at once, because yes, that could be overwhelming. So can you put in something in there that it's, it's, they shouldn't be disconnected for non-payment during the time of the emergency and then, um, but that, and then they need to make arrangements to pay the debt. I, I don't know how you say that. Well, I, they, Tucker. If I may, if I could just say one more thing, I think, um, and Senator Clarkson, you would know that in the, with respect to rent, it's like during the declared emergency and so many days after. No, I believe it's 90 days after. Is that so what you're we getting? could maybe mirror yes. that. Yeah. T Tucker can check, but I'm pretty sure it's with David Hall, but I'm pretty sure it's 90 days. I, I will check in on that. So I have a few notes here that I'll recap on the section. First, uh, Senator Bray brought up that it might be necessary to add a carve out here that disconnections are allowed in the case that the water system is contaminated and the drinking water is unsafe, right? So you have the emergency, the prohibition on disconnects kicks in, except in the case where it is unsafe to consume water or we'll come up with something similar. Uh, the second is we can add a clause in there that says, and it should be just as simple, that the rate payer remains obligated for the charges or rates accrued during the um, state of emergency. So that would make sure that the customer, you know, still has this obligation through the uh, moratorium on the disconnect. Um, and the final thing that uh, Karen brought up here is that you you still haven't maybe identified what types of emergencies should trigger this. Um, and I don't know if it makes sense to connect this specifically to those emergencies where the consumer or ratepayer is compelled to shelter in place, whether it makes sense to connect it to all emergencies as you have it now. Um, if you, look at, if you look at the list of hazards that can trigger this declared state of emergency, there are some broad events there that maybe don't connect as adequately to the uh, water service. Sorry, my dog is itching very aggressively. <laughs> sort of like it was using a hammer. I know. That's what I thought. It's all that discussion of water. It wants to go find a stream and lake and paddle around. I, I don't know how, I don't know the answer to that. Does anybody have how, how you define, I'm thinking that it, it is connected to some kind of an emergency that, that impacts people's ability to pay, that it isn't whether they're having to stay at home or not, but it impacts their ability to pay. So if you had uh, some kind of a- Financial, so nobody, yeah, it's a yeah, financial so the, disruption of some major variety. So that people couldn't go to work or they couldn't have their jobs. Or I think that in my mind, it's more connected to their inability to pay than whether they have to stay at home or not. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, some significant financial disruption that would uh, upend their ability to earn money as, as we are experiencing now. And I guess 
some of that might end up then looking at a case by case basis, because if you had some kind of a, a natural disaster um, and a flood and um, it wiped out the bakery where you work. So now you can't go to, and it's a declared emergency. Everybody else in town can go to work. Does that mean that I am covered by this because I can't, I, I don't know. Well, I think you're right though. It's a, it's a health emergency that affects somebody's ability to, to make payments. So if a, if a health emergency that results in a significant financial loss or something to those people. I think it does have to be connected somehow. But that also means, going back to one thing we talked about a couple minutes ago, if that's the case, that it's a financial problem that's resulting in this inability to cut off the water, you don't want them to come back and when the emergency is over and say, okay, now you got to pay up everything right away. You want them to pay, pay back on a, some kind of schedule that's reasonable, which Wait. you didn't mention that when you, um, Tucker, you didn't mention that when you were going through your summary a minute ago. Just put it out there. I think Karen said that most towns will pay, will work with. And I think we heard from them that before we, I have this memory of in GovOps some time ago dealing with um, shutoffs to apartments um, yeah. for water. And how, if the, the landlord doesn't pay the, the water bill and the tenants get shut off. We had a long um, working with the towns on how that would work. And I think that was resolved. You're right, yeah. it was resolved. It had to do with um, with uh, legal aid was, was bringing it on behalf of some lower income tenants. We did resolve it, but I don't remember what we did, but we fixed it. Well, I think that the tenant has the ability to take on the billing going forward. The tenant wouldn't, I believe, not be liable for the past dues, but that the tenant could take it on going forward. And oh, yeah. that way the water would stay connected. Yeah. So how do we resolve this on the connection we want to make here to the type of emergency? Or is this, is this an issue where it's too soon for us without more um, in, input to um, put it into the lessons learned bill. Allison? I think uh, Tucker's uh, gift with drafting could come up with something about um, uh, financial disruption uh, that would work um, because uh, you know, a significant financial disruption to the lives uh, in, in that area or however you want to define it. Um, and I also think it's very simple. Every town has, I mean, good, well-managed towns have, have schedules upon which people are, are able, when they're in financial distress, able to pay their property tax and their sewer and water bills. Which leads me to the question, why are we not talking about property tax here as well? We're talking about water systems and sewer, but we're not talking about the much bigger bill, which is even more important for people, which is property tax. Uh, some of those issues, which you did address during COVID around municipal property taxes, extending deadlines, waiving associated penalties, uh, that may be adequately addressed by some of the Australian ballot and annual meeting provisions uh, we've been okay. working on. Because then the legislative body has the power to kind of put those issues before the voters and the voters can then decide on how they want to adjust property taxes moving forward, you know, how they want to address the budget. The, um, you know, some of the temporary provisions that you worked on were specifically because the voters had no power at the time that you were working on those issues right. to make those decisions. Oh, good point. Thanks. Karen, does that make sense to you? Uh, yeah, yes, I think it does as well. You know, the collector of delinquent taxes is really the person- Whoops, you're frozen up with a bit, schedule. I think. Pardon? No, you were fine. 
Oh, okay. Um, the collector of delinquent taxes is the person who works with, you know, a taxpayer to come up with a schedule for payments and, and um, things like that. So the process for uh, tax delinquencies and, and the effects there or the consequences, I suppose, of not paying are spelled out pretty specifically in the statute. And it's not on the turn of a dime um, that you would be losing your property. Right. And so the, the, we, don't, we don't need to address it here specifically because we've addressed it with the Australian ballot ability of the town to, to decide in their meeting that they're gonna change the dates of collection or they're gonna change the, the, the penalty rate or whatever for that period of time. And, they're, and they can change the budget. They're gonna change the right. budget. So yeah. I okay. think it's okay. Okay. All right, so um, with um, <clears throat> Tucker's magic, I guess we will <coughs> maybe have another draft tomorrow about this. Yes. Is that possible? Okay. That is possible. All right. So are we ready then to move on to Tucker's last section, which I believe is the open meeting section? So we've covered the change in the uh, open meeting section. Oh, we yeah. Have covered the new section on water gotcha. disconnections. The last yeah. piece that you asked me to check back in on was the uh, section from the uh, Act 92 COVID response bill dealing with the extension of deadlines, licenses, and permits that are issued by a Oh, right, right, X, Y, Z, yeah. Right. X, Y, Z bill. Yeah, section. this is uh, section X, Y, Z in the draft on page seven. And based on the conversations that you all had last week, I broke out the section that deals with those deadlines, plans, permits, and licenses that are issued and administered by the municipality. I took that section out, um, organized it so it's a bit easier to read, and it contains the same authority that during a declared state of emergency, a municipal corporation has the authority to extend any statutory deadline that's applicable to a municipality, provided that it doesn't deal with any of the licenses, permits, programs, or plans that are issued or administered by the state. And I made a small but potentially significant addition here that says, or the federal government. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was absent in Act 92, uh, but reviewing the language, I realized that there may be federal grant requirements uh, if a municipality is qualified and receive them that they may still need to comply with and that the state may not have the authority to suspend even during a state of emergency. Um, second, that they may extend or waive deadlines applicable to the licenses, permits, and programs that the town municipal corporation uh, administers. So they'll be able to um, extend those deadlines. Moving forward, uh, the piece that may have been, right. So uh, subsection B deals with the temporal element around um, these extensions. It says that any expiring license permit program or plan issued by the municipality shall remain valid for 90 days after the date that the declared state of emergency ends. And as I recall, the committee did discuss whether 90 days is the right number. And what I can't recall is whether you said that's the perfect number or whether that should be adjusted based on what the plan program or license is. I don't remember if we said 90 days was the magic number or I think that if we started saying it depends on what the what it is, then there's too many. Well, variations. 90 days. Yeah, I agree. Right. I don't think I don't, I don't, less, I don't think we uh, talked about 
making them variable. We didn't, I don't think we talked about that, at least not very seriously. And 90, uh, 90 days was what we put in um, the other language. So I would just leave it that way because that passed and that seemed to be um, acceptable yeah. to people. It, it, yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions for Tucker? Lots, but that not that pertain to this bill. Okay. <laughs> so, um, where are we, committee? We have been. Closer. We're getting closer. Is there anybody else out there that would like to weigh in that hasn't had a chance to weigh in? I I think the only other person out there is Gwyn. Correct. Gail. Secretary Young will be joining the committee at 2.30. Oh, oh, right. Great. Right, we'd ask for them to weigh in on the from yep. the administration's point of view. All right, so. Um, isn't so this, isn't, may I just say, oh, Jenna, I think this is inspiring me to think about every committee ought to be doing this same kind of bill. Yes, I. But my hope was that every committee would do something like this or send us their the, section yeah. their, their section and it could be put into a less into one full bill but i don't think that i have um asked health and welfare because i know they had a lot of a lot of stuff you know um extensions and stuff but um i haven't heard from any other committee well i, I will mention it to michael because we have a huge amount uh, in terms of staying evictions, staying foreclosures, uh, the unemployment, uh, uh, you know, unemployment insurance, uh, you know, workers comp. There's a ton of stuff that we've learned and that would, that might be added. Uh, and I don't think we sadly have the time at the moment to do that, but we need to make space for that uh, going forward. Chris? Well, happily, since I'm in here, you you already did take in what natural work mm -hmm. about, like uh, mm -hmm. yeah. the water and sewer. Yeah, yeah, we did. Do do we, Chris? The other thing we put in there, I thought, was um, the ability for operators to um, help out other operators or other municipalities. Do we? Did that become permanent or do we need to put something in here about that? I think there was actually a provision in the law pre-existing, but I don't think it was a bit dormant. It was some post Irene oh. Karen will help me remember. It was, and there was a model contract for towns to use with other towns in order to be able to move operators around without incurring liability in the town to which they were loaning themselves. And I think that those are municipal to municipal agreements. And I don't remember in the end that we had any state role in that. Karen, can you help out on that? that that's correct. We, we have uh, mutual aid agreements between towns for actually a whole range of things, emergency medical services, you know, fire, transport, uh, road graders, and think of something. And there's a model, um, template on our website that was put together by our property casualty liability insurance program that addresses that. So I don't believe in the end you had to write any legislation around that particular issue. That's my recollection too. Once we asked the questions, people got that contract out, sort of tuned it up, and then people executed it as they thought it might um, ahead of time right. in case they needed it. And I don't know that there was any case uh, related to COVID happily enough where, where any operating uh, wastewater treatment facility or public water supply ended up having people enough people out to require that kind of mutual aid. Yeah, I haven't heard that they have, but of course we're not finished yet. Um, but, the, but those agreements are in place around the state. And I think all the, that, made me think about EMS. And I think that all of the provisions that we did around EMS have the ones that need to be permanently 
changed have been changed in 124, assuming we'll get that passed. Am I right about that? I think so. <coughs> I think that um, Drew and Dan Batesy um, worked with us on that. We did end up in natural talking about one other thing. I mean, we have this strange jurisdictional uh, divide. <laughs> We, we split things with finance um, and so it was actually finance that checked in with in the end uh, with Department of Public Service and the PUC, although we both committees ended up talking to them to also provide for not getting disconnected from um, utilities. So gas, electric, other, other utilities, non-public. <laughs> Did they have to do legislation or did they just tell them not to? The PUC, I think, actually decided on its own. Tucker can help me remember. I think they actually, well, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> the PUC, I think, actually issued, and we were in discussions with them, and I think they actually acted on their own to execute an order um, okay. suspending those things, basically sort of mirroring what the administration was already doing. And we were just discussing it and they had the power to do that without anything more from the legislature. So they did. Okay. So we don't need to do anything there. <clears throat> okay. Anything else that um, while we're um, waiting, then what I will do is I'll, um, I think Betsy Ann went over 220 with us um, the other day about the changes that they had made and they all seem to be pretty benign. And then she's working with Jen Carby on this um, pharmacy issue. Then <clears throat> next week we had told, um, and I don't remember this man's name, Richard um, something that who, <laughs> the Veterans for Peace. Richard, Ch Ch Pl Ch I think it's Chaplinsky. Okay. Something like that. That we would, on Tuesday, we would um, invite the guard and have the, just a discussion about, about that, about who, who has um, authority over the guard when some kind of an emergency is declared. And is it the governor, the president? How, how do we use the guard? And I, <coughs> I think that is an important issue to discuss. I don't think there's any legislation necessarily, but um, um, we did say we would hear from them. And then uh, by that time, I'm also hoping that um, S1, that the house will be done with S124 and that we can go over that so we can get that worked out. And <clears throat> Wednesday, I would like to hear, and I know that there's nothing to do about this, but in judiciary the other day, um, uh, Colonel Baker was in and talked about um, the lack of PPE in corrections and how they were having such a hard time getting the PPEs. And he said that one of the huge problems was purchasing, getting a, the right to purchase something from um, BGS because they at one point had identified, I don't remember, I'm ma making up these numbers now, 60,000 of something that they needed. And by the time they got the approval to do the purchase, it was down to like 15,000 were left. So I think we uh, need to just, because purchasing is in our bailiwick. And I think we just need to hear from BGS about what provisions they made to deal with um, emergency purchases and um, yeah. how that happened. Does that make sense that we should hear actually, that? It makes, it makes a lot of sense. It actually comes under lessons learned as well. I don't know if there's anything we can do about it, but it's certainly relevant to lessons learned. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Uh -huh. Brian? Yeah, I, I think we'd like to hear from, uh, is Chris Cole still there or is he already? I don't, <clears throat> I think he uh, has already left. So I don't know who's there. <coughs> yeah, I'd like to hear from BGS. Yeah. 
Okay, so we will do that. And then I just heard from the um, House uh, at the end of last week that they're going to be doing the Burlington Charter and the Barry Charter and sending them to us. So um, I the guess Bur we will. The Burlington Charter with the guns? No, no, no. It's a <clears throat> really benign, not, do you know about it, Tucker? Are you the charter person? He is. Yeah, the, uh, the Burlington Charter amendments for this year mostly pertain to allowing uh, early voting for municipal elections. So it's, it's mirroring some state law uh, in a few of the provisions, but in general, allowing early and mail-in voting. So um, I think it's four total amendments that will end up coming out. Uh, I actually can't recall what's in the Barry City Charter. It has not yet been introduced, but um, I think it's going to be on its way. And I was assured that it was also very non-controversial. So if, if we get them, I, I mean, I think that if they take them up, we'll know by next Wednesday whether they take them up or not, even if they haven't passed them. And we can do the same thing we do with charters, sometimes is <clears throat> take them up so that we're ready for them when they come. Will that work? Sure. Because <clears throat> I, I want to, um, is there anything else that people can think of that, <coughs> sorry about that, that we should be addressing here? 220, 124, lessons learned, charters. Those are our, that's what's left. And the National Guard and BGS, which oh, right. are and just Guard. hearings, but anything else that we, it, it, in my, it makes sense to me to um, leave the last week unscheduled <clears throat> because we don't know what the floor time will be or how we'll be dealing with it. <clears throat> get everything done by the 21st. Is that the Friday? Whatever that Friday is. The 25th. 25th. No, yeah. the Friday. 25th is that. Friday. Oh, Friday the, the... 18th. 18th. The 18th. <clears throat> so that we leave the last week um, unscheduled. That makes sense. I think that's very wise because <laughs> who knows how packed it <coughs> might be and how start and stop they might be and all that. Yeah. Stuff. <clears throat> and really, the only, we need to, I'm really committed to getting 220 and 124 out and lessons learned, those three, and then the charters if they come. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So do you want to take a little break? Sure. Sure. So let's come back at 225. Sure. That gives okay. us a 10 minute break. <clears throat> okay, so committee, we have Suzanne Young with us. And Suzanne, let me just, um, I'm hoping that what we sent you was explanatory enough that you know what we're doing, but what we, are trying to do is um, take the lessons that we learned from this um, pandemic in terms of <clears throat> um, adjustments we needed to make. And we're just, we're looking at our area here. Mm -hmm. um, we were hoping that many committees would do this so that if we find ourselves in the same position and we're not in session, or even if we are in session, we don't have to scramble and start all over again. So what we're trying to do is <clears throat> um, look at how we might put stuff into statute that is triggered by a declared state of emergency by the governor mm -hmm. and that has an impact of um, making it in the uh, sense in the part about open meetings, for example, it creates the inability for people to meet in person. So it depends on what the impact is. And so what we thought we would do is ask <clears throat> the administration if there were 
issue areas here, particularly around whether or not you needed to have any legislative ability to um, extend deadlines um, that would be valuable to put in here so that you didn't have to have legislative approval every time there was a declared state of emergency. So that's what we're trying to get in okay. here. And we hope to have this, I mean, we're going to pass this out by Thursday because um, if it's going to get to the house and be worked on and then get to the governor, we need to act quickly. So okay. <clears throat> we'll put in as much as we can. And we know that we won't get everything in there that people might want because there just isn't time to debate it and to get it in. But so with that, um, is that lay the groundwork enough for you to yeah, I think so, Senator. Thank you for having me and thank you for, for asking me to um, uh, appear today. So what I had focused on was um, the language that Council Rask sent to me, um, I think on Friday, uh, which was draft language that would amend Title 20, the emergency management chapter to allow the governor um, to extend expiration dates of professional licenses uh, if an event um, occurred that would create a barrier to obtaining renewal. So I, I did take a look at that. Um, I don't know if there are other Title 20 amendments that you're considering, but if there are, I, I haven't seen them and I, I don't have any additional to offer up at this time. I've talked to some folks within the governor's office who, who drafts a lot of the executive orders. And um, at this point, you know, I think we're pretty good. And I think the reason we are is because um, we're confident that the governor's um, emergency management powers um, already allow for the extension um, of these expiration dates. Uh, the authority, the governor's authority to act in an emergency when the needs created by the emer emergency warrant that action, um, then we're pretty confident he does have that authority and he has been exercising that authority um, through executive order. He did it with the Department of Motor Vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe he did it, um, I directed the commissioner of health to take certain steps for certain um, uh, medical professionals uh, within the Department of Health. Um, and we're also confident that you know, the governor can suspend rules that may apply to these professionals without consultation or approval from other officers or agencies of the state. So, it, and I guess that's a long-winded way of saying we're not sure that the particular language Betsy Ann sent um, is necessary. Um, but with that said, um, if the legislature is interested in, in, in codifying this, then we've got some suggestions. Um, we did in the executive order, um, it, when we uh, extended licenses for some professionals that were within the purview of the Office of Professional Regulation at the, at the Secretary of State's office, those executive orders did say with approval of the Secretary of State, the governor is directing the commissioner of health or whoever to um, you know, suspend certain requirements. And that is because the nature and length of this emergency allowed time for this governor to act collaboratively with agency heads and elected officials and to be deferential when we could um, and include them as part of the process. Um, as we all know, this has been a, a very long, um, a long emergency and a long pandemic. And um, unlike one that may be very sudden where we don't have the luxury of that time. And I don't mean that to suggest we have luxury of time, but we don't have the time to work with other elected officials or agency heads to do the work. And, and so that is why um, his executive orders have included provisions in some cases for consultation with or approval of others, though it's, it's not required under his broad emergency authorities. Um, let me just see, I had a couple other notes. So we don't oppose codification of the governor's authority to extend licenses and waive fees that's laid out in the draft um, that I received, but we've gotta be very careful that the effect of the legislation um, should not and does not limit or hamper the go a governor's authority to act as he or she deems necessary to respond to a declared emergency. And so the codification of the authority in our view should be drafted to apply regardless of 
which entity the profession resides in, which is what the language um, I've reviewed seems to do. And, and I you know, have to remind myself and others that remember this is an emergency um, authority during a declared state of emergency where the governor has authorities um, that he might not have in normal times and that by law um, pretty much um, puts the other elected officials in, in a, um, I'm going to try to find the right term here in the statute, um, effectively where other offices and agencies of the state become an instrument in the governor in an emergency. So if you look at some of the other authorities in Title 20, the governor can utilize services and facilities of existing officers and agencies of the state, cities, towns, um, and you know, use and employ within the state from time to time as, as he or she may deem expedient any of the services, resources, property of the state for the purposes set forth in the chapter to respond to the emergency. So, so we would want to be really careful that um, we didn't put language in there that could be construed as limiting or hampering, hampering any governor's authority to act as, as deemed necessary um, in a declared emergency. So our thinking was if you're going to codify this, we would ask you to consider um, that the authority um, be drafted to apply regardless of which entity the profession resides in. Because right now, it, 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 I think it, 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 was, it took me a while to kind of sort through the language to determine why is it worded this way. Um, and as you can see from the language, it basically says, in consultation with a head of a professional regulatory entity within an agency under the office of governor. I guess we could make the argument that under the office of governor in an emergency means, you know, everybody's under the, um, under the office of the governor, but I'm not sure that's what was intended. So we would just wanna be careful that we're not having these, these kind of debates about what does under the office of governor mean. Um, it would probably just be cleanest and, and in, would be consistent with existing authority that we believe he has to just say the governor can extend for up to 90 days at a time the expiration date of a current professional license or other authorization to practice a profession um, or waive the fees. Um, and if you want that to be in, in, in consultation, um, with with the head of the professional regulatory entity, I would just take out this notion that it has to lie within the agent, an agency under the governor. And maybe I'm not understanding why it's worded that way, but that was the single thing that um, jumped out at us as problematic in interpretation. So um, I think that we, because our committee deals with OPR, yeah, that we very specifically um, dealt with them. And then our hope was that you would have some maybe more general language than that would, that would extend, that would codify that ability with other professions so that people who are in fire and safety, for example, <clears throat> or uh, ANR, if, or um, Agency of Education if they need to have license extensions, that there would be some general language in here that um, gives the ability for the governor to extend those deadlines. Um, and I think with OPR, it's pretty clear that it would be in consultation with the, um, the advisory board or the professional organization, whatever there's, um, Board of Medical Practice in here that has some. And um, <clears throat> in, in the general, I don't know that, that that needs to be done if the governor is just given the ability to extend those license deadlines. And the other one was around, um, excuse me, permits and other kinds of licenses that um, may be under, do, do you need legislative would it be better to have it codified that, for example, um, DMV, um, that it's <clears throat> already, that, that you can extend the deadlines on those or fishing and hunting licenses if you can't 
they they expire and if you can't get them um, at a, in a timely manner that you have the ability to actually yep. do that, that we codify that. I think that's where we were going. Okay. Well, that's helpful. Um, I think my, my broad, broad response to that is that we have done that, all of that through executive order under mm -hmm. the state of emergency. And the governor's authority, um, for instance, on the DMV front, he basically directed the commissioner under his emergency authorities to extend certain deadlines um, because the pandemic prevented folks, well, prevented folks from obtaining their um, renewals or whatever service it was. And what, what I am saying is that we did not need uh, to have that codified. It's, it's generally codified in the governor's emergency authorities. And then under the state of emergency, the governor has been implementing this, um, I think very carefully through executive orders and to the extent where he can consult um, with another elected official or another agency or department, he has put that in the executive order that I will do this in consultation with you know, X person, X official. Um, and one of them, I know that he went with the approval of the Secretary of State um, for like nursing licenses, I think, when he first um, uh, suspended some of the requirements for, for the nursing staff at the height of the pandemic. Um, I guess I would, that I think that's what we've done. I don't think it needs to be codified um, because I think he can do it under his general authority without consultations with others, but this governor has chosen to do so. And I'm afraid that <clears throat> putting that notion that there are separate emergency authorities into Title 20 is, um, is going to be confusing. It may dilute the governor's authority um, or ability to act during an emergency. I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, but what if they don't agree? Um, what if, you know, there, there could be some really critical decisions that need to be made that are now hinged on somebody else exercising their own emergency authorities where in an emergency, the notion is you have one, one, one guy in charge, a woman or a man who's the governor. So I don't know what you've done in the other sections of, of the draft um, with respect to the secretary of state. And I apologize, I was not aware of that. I only have that one section. Well, I think so, the other, the other um, things that we put in there are the um, giving the director of OPR and the executive director of the um, medical board the ability to act when they can't, um, when the board itself can't meet to act. And both have used, have used it, the medical board less, but OPR has used it um, <clears throat> in this emergency. So I think that was the other um, beyond the yep. deadline for, um, yeah. Uh, that was the other major one. Can, does anybody, I don't have the draft right here in front of me. Does anybody remember what else? Um, we have a lot in there that isn't related to licenses and um, yeah. But are they all related? I guess I should take a look at the draft. I apologize. I didn't realize it was more relating to emergency authorities than this particular section. Yeah. Oh, there, there's a lot, there's a lot. There about um, open meetings, uh, okay. municipal municipal government, um, which I don't think the, the governor has the ability to, to do because those are set in statute. And we spent a lot of time at the beginning of the mm -hmm. session um, I mean, at the beginning of March, trying to deal with this, and we didn't want to have to scramble again. Chris, yeah. did you have a comment? Yeah, I was just thinking of another category, Secretary Young, that we ran into issues around um, limitations on executive orders, and that was on in the world of solid waste, for instance. Um, there are there's enforcement discretion, but it's uh, my understanding it's supposed to be case by case, as opposed to saying, for instance, that. Uh, any bottle redemption center can waive accepting bottles back during the emergency, um, 
which was for a class of um, businesses, not just for a individual business. And then we did move, um, the house still has it, they haven't acted on it, variance language that worked, that would allow the secretary of a &R to modify solid waste rules on an emergency basis. Um, because already there was, for the individuals, there was enforcement discretion as a workaround tool. But for whole categories of actors, there was no tool available um, for an, an emergency response. And because it was statutory, um, it wasn't waivable. So I'm just kind of flag, we happily things went well and we didn't end up needing that um, variance language that the house still has. But it just made me aware that had things gone another way, we very much would have needed it. And we don't yet have that one nailed down. There's no provision set up currently to address a similar situation in the future around uh, a &R. Uh, Okay, I, I'm thinking the title, title 20 does allow um, the governor to, to in consultation with the secretary do some pretty broad things. Um, so uh, um, I guess I, I'm somewhat surprised that there was not the ability to um, to run with that in an executive order. I, I'm not sure if the, the standard really is it's in statute versus rule. Right. Um, Maybe Mike, Tucker can. Yeah, well, on the solid waste side, I was just gonna say, Mike O'Grady helped draft the variance language that we put in 227, um, which is parked over in the house now, but mm -hmm. so, so just as a resource, he ended up working through in a lot of detail with the committee where the, where the authorities began and ended, what could and could not be done. And that's why that language got crafted. Okay. Maybe I'd ask Tucker to weigh in here a little bit. Sure, I, I don't want to get into too deep of an, an analysis mm -hmm. and potentially uh, over speak on the issue of 20 BSA chapter one, but certainly one of the concerns that exists is a constitutional one and whether statute can be suspended by the executive branch, even in uh, a time of emergency. And the mo most general response to that would be that it would be unconstitutional for the legislature to give the governor the authority to abrogate or suspend statute. That would be the general response. That is without many, many, many guardrails around it, likely a non-delegable non authority. That is your supreme legislative authority. So that might be something that uh, when Betsy has time over the next two days that we may want to dive into with some detail. And uh, you know, there's distinctions there. Senator Bray brought up uh, codified provisions around solid waste districts. Senator White, you brought up uh, some of the fish and game requirements earlier. There are fish and game requirements that are in rule and that the governor would likely have the authority to suspend or abrogate because they have been issued by the executive branch. There are others that are codified in Title 10 appendix. Those are very specific, uh, often updated statutes that would need to be suspended paused or repealed in order for those requirements to go away. Um, you know, this is gonna require a review of 20 BSA chapter one to see what type of authority has already been delegated, but a broad power to suspend statute is not likely to be embedded there. So what I, what I think I'm saying, and I appreciate that, and I, I expect there will be some differences of opinion on that, but I, I guess respectfully what I'm suggesting in this particular language for the professional licenses is, is to keep it broad. Um, keep it broad meaning do not confine it to under the office of agencies under the office of the governor. Um, so that any governor has the flexibility um, to move forward with that particular action um, uh, without relying on, on others to do the same um, within 
uh, professions within their their statutory purview. So if if that is where um, you're drawing the line, I would just give that authority to the governor in consultation with the the professional regulatory entity, but not confine the governor's authority to just those within the office of the governor. So in other words, as I think I mentioned, and if I could find my notes again, um, I'm suggesting if you if you want to codify this particular authority, that you that you expand it um, to make it as broad as it needs to be. Once we start narrowing a governor's authority by statute and parsing out, well, he gets to do this because it's a rule, and he gets to do that because the statute. Um, I think we're we're headed down. Um, you know, a path that, that could be hard for any governor to navigate, but but with with Tucker's um, concerns in mind, with this particular language, uh, I, I wouldn't want anything in here to be debatable if we're in an emergency and we have a governor who needs to act quickly. And if there's disagreement, we won't always agree. I mean, we are very lucky in this state to have elected officials who've worked together very strongly and um, very, very, very carefully and very wisely. Um, and we have put in the executive orders, this governor has put in his executive orders that deference to, for instance, the secretary of state when something fell in his purview. My point is I don't believe that's required. We don't believe that's required by law, but we do understand that that's the way we work collaboratively when we can in an emergency where we have um, the time and the ability to do that. So, come <laughs> oh, Chris? Yeah, just one, you know, so to throw into the mix as we're sorting our way through, I think the one of the things I ended up learning about as we tried to sort out the solid waste provisions was that in chapter two, article 20 of the constitution, there's a, a short sentence, uh, the governor is also to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, which also can mean, as I came to appreciate, not executed in the form of allowing enforcement discretion. And so it was, there's a lot of nuance to these relationships and I just wanted to yeah. Flag I know, that in, <laughs> I, I know, and the, in enforcement, there is always that notion of the prosecutorial discretion um, and law enforcement discretion to to a degree, but um, primarily the enforcement would lie with the um, authority that actually takes the offender, you know, to task uh, either in court or before an administrative board. So new for me was that faithful execution might include not executing that particular <laughs> yeah, moment. I hear you. So I guess um, I am a little, a little confused here and hopefully um, I'm the only one that everybody <laughs> else is really clear. But um, so the Gov the administrator, the governor does not have any input into the licensing under OPR. Am I right about that? That's a purely a secretary of state and OPR decision. So um, I, I don't know that um, the governor has the ability to, to do those uh, extensions unless the Secretary of State and OPR are in agreement. And what we're doing here is trying to say, the Secretary of State and OPR have the ability to do those extensions during a declared state of emergency. I don't, I may be wrong here, but I don't think that the governor has any ability to affect those licenses because they're not under the administration where the AOE and ANR um, public safety, those are, and the governor does have the ability to um, extend those probably under an executive order. Um, but I don't, 
Am I wrong about that? It just seems to me that um, I, I don't think that the governor has a role in OPR licensing. Well, I think what I was trying to, to say and didn't say it very clearly is that when there is a state of emergency, the governor um, is basically has been provided um, additional powers within certain areas. And if you look at the, um, the powers and you look, I believe at sections five and six in particular, um, other elected officials and agencies become an instrumentality of the governor because he is basically making decisions in an emergency. So the point of having emergency powers is for the governor to be able to make these calls where outside of an emergency, absolutely those duties fall to other officials, other secretaries, uh, you know, secretaries, I mean, um, elected officials and independent uh, boards and commissions. But the way we read, especially uh, sections five and six is that um, those, those fall in an emergency or be fall to the governor to make those calls. And this governor has made those calls in consultation with um, and with the approval of the Secretary of State, specifically in his executive orders. He has he has deferred, he has he has consulted with the Secretary of State on issues about professional regulation within his purview. He has directed the commissioner of health who serves the governor, who he can direct to do something to, to make changes in the medical practice. But again, I think we have to understand that in a state of emergency, if you look at those sections, unfortunately, someone has to be in charge and the statutory construct is that is a governor and that the governor and others who may be elected officials, maybe other officials, um, are become an instrumentality of the governor and he has that authority to, to direct them to do things. But again, we're very fortunate that this emergency and that this governor has chosen to do so in a collaborative fashion and in his executive orders. So, and so I'm saying this, I don't believe this language is necessary. Um, he has done these these, um, he has issued orders that have extended deadlines and the like. I understand the distinction you're making that this is not in statute, but again, um, we read the emergency language as basically saying he could direct the secretary of state. He could direct, you know, someone, some, some other elected official to do something that's within their authority because they become the instrumentality of the governor in an, uh, in an emergency. And that's how we construe five and six and just general emergency powers generally. I, I get that. But so why did we spend so much time in this committee dealing with open meetings, public records, uh, access to land records, um, EMS issues, we spent an inordinate amount of time in March and April right. addressing those issues. When, if the governor had the ability to do it, he could have just done it. And, but we, we, we angsted over open meetings and municipal elections and- um, Elections. <laughs> elections in general and yeah. Um, OPR, uh, all of it, abilities, the board of medical practice, their, their ability to function, um, I mean, EMS, EMS issues. We spent a lot of time on EMS issues, changing, changing a three-year, I mean, a one-year licensing to a three-year licensing because that's what they needed. So I guess, my question is, if we did, if we hadn't needed to do that, all that work, why did we? Well, that, that's a good question. And I, I hope it's rhetorical because I don't know the answer, Senator. I do know that the legislature, um, from what I understand, was, was wanting to be helpful and, one, and it's a capacity issue as well, right? Um, so the governor's team is, is working on responding to a medical emergency 
um, it's responding to um, you know, building medical capacity while, while containing the spread of the virus. And that was a very intense, very resource-driven effort. It still is. And the legislature was looking to be helpful. And those are the types of issues, uh, open meeting and maybe the public records. I was not involved in those. Um, but those were things that we could use your help on. And, and you did help on because those were not as emergent as the work that we were doing at the time and continue to do. So we appreciate the legislature helping with that and clarifying um, issues around those because we would probably still be noodling over those um, you know, if, if, if we had to issue executive orders on every single process and procedure. And that's what we're trying to avoid here. Yeah. Is, and while is I'm, exactly yeah. that, that we can put in statute Right. that there doesn't need to be an executive order to say right you have the ability to to extend deadlines it's right. here in the statute it says tucker and i think i think the statute is fine to codify codify that i just i think where the rub is for us is um leaving leaving it um to solely agencies under the office of the governor i mean what other agencies just, are there well the secretary of state well, that's a separate. That's yeah, which I was not aware of when. So oh. I, I didn't. But oh, okay. um, I, my point is that you wouldn't have to do that. In, you know, you could just do what the governor did in his executive order, which was direct um, direct some some easing up of some professional um, licensing requirements during the height of the emergency. Uh, and it was in consultation um, and with the approval of the Secretary of State. That's what was in the executive order. Um, so uh, we're just we're just hoping that we don't refine this so finely that we're not going to be able to do what needs to be done in a different type type of an emergency, because um, the governor at the time and others are not agreeing as to where to go. When you need one person in charge with that authority. Um, hopefully in consultation with those who normally would make those calls. That's all I'm, I'm saying is that an emergency, you know, I, I think this is fine to codify, but I think it creates a lot of ambiguity to leave it within an agency under the office of the governor. But, but I, I mean, you can in consultation with the head of the entity would bring the secretary of state into it and any other a licensing entity that may be independent of the governor's um, agencies or, or the secretary of state. So all, I, all I'm suggesting is keep it, uh, keep it simple and, and this could be construed as a limit on the governor's authority when he may need it at some future time in some future emergency. I, I need to back up here just a little bit, I guess. I'm, I am really confused. We have a whole section dealing with LPR and their ability to extend licenses. Then we had a separate section, I believe, and I don't have the bill in front of me, but and then we had a separate section that gives general authority to this governor to extend licenses um, to those w uh, in the administration. OPR is already taken care of over here in the bill. Yeah. And then this is, this is a different one that gives um, the ability for fish and wildlife or driver's licenses or um, anything else. And so I don't think that this limits the governor. I think this gives the governor authority for everything within the um, within the governor's purview. Am I wrong, uh, Betsy or Tucker? Hi, Hello. Betsy Ann. Hello, I'm just joining you. Hello, Secretary Young. Hi. Hi. So I'm just catching, I was midway through the secretary's uh, comments. And so I'm inferring you're looking at that draft 3.1, starting on page three, that would allow the governor to extend uh, professional licenses under the office of governor. And that's where you're at right now. Okay. And yeah, so this language right now is limited to professional licenses um, regulated by agencies under the office of governor. And then there would be um, the next section on page four would 
allow the director of OPR to extend OPR mm -hmm. professional licenses. And uh, right now that the language only uh, um, applies to professional licenses, it doesn't apply to things like driver's licenses or any mm -hmm. other things. So I, did, I didn't catch if the secretary was suggesting that it should be uh, enlarged to things beyond professional licenses. Um, the, the secretary was suggesting that we um, have done that. We have directed the, the commissioner of motor vehicle to, to take certain actions with respect to DMV licenses and renewals and extensions, um, that that is part of his emergency powers uh, and that we do not need to have it codified. And we're pretty confident. Um, we're quite confident in, in our construction of the governor's um, emergency authorities in that regard. Um, what I've said about the particular language that you sent me on Friday, and I apologize, I have not read the entire bill. I did not realize there was more to it. Um, what I've said about the uh, current language around licensing is um, that the governor does not need this particular law to extend professional licenses um, and that he could do so under his current authorities because other elected officials um, in state agencies become an instrumentality of the governor under sections five and six in the emergency orders. So he could arguably uh, direct the secretary of state to extend licenses of professionals within the secretary of state's purview. He's chosen not to do that um, in his executive orders because um, we had the time during this emergency to uh, draft executive orders in consultation with, for instance, the Secretary of State. And in fact, one of them um, does require the approval of the Secretary of State. Um, so we've acted collaboratively. We've done what we did not believe we had to do by statute, but we've, but we've done it by executive order. And that's you know, it, it's a good thing. We're all very fortunate that we all get along and that we're a small state and we're collaborative. So um, that's the way he chose to operate um, through these executive orders to be collaborative with the legislature, to be collaborative with um, other elected officials when the emergency allowed. And so I think that does answer a, a bit of your questions, um, Senator White, is that the Pub, the, the public meetings and the public records requests were not a burning fire, you know, during this emergency, oh, but, yes, something they that were. Needed, but something that needed to be dealt with. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, I'm, and I'm sorry if I minimize that, but I, I didn't mean any disrespect. I'm just saying it was something that could have had, you know, had a more mindful approach to it. Um, so, that's simply what I'm saying is this, this language is not necessary, but if you would like to codify the authority um, for Betsy's benefit, um, I was recommending that it be reworded um, to take out that provision um, under the office of the governor and just give the governor the authority to do what he can now, which is to extend um, the expiration of uh, professional licenses. So does, does the governor right now have the ability to extend professional licenses under OPR? We believe he does. Um, and, and yes, we do believe he does. And he's, um, I think that we have done that with the secretary of state by executive order. There's a difference between the law and the executive order. And I'm looking to see if I can find the particular executive order because there are several. Tucker? But he chose to do so with the approval of the Secretary of State in the executive order. I'm saying that wasn't a necessary provision, but that is how he chose to operate. Tucker? That particular. I feel like there's a very robust constitutional discussion that could be happening right now. And I think no. it would be very helpful for the committee to constrain some of the discussion around the professional licensing the open meeting law provisions and some of the municipal provisions have been brought up a few times. I would set those aside as entirely different. And from my subject area, I would question at a very aggressive and high degree, the governor's authority to suspend the open meeting laws that are in statute. 
I would also call to your attention the fact that all of the powers that are being referenced were granted to the governor by statute. These are not divine, they are codified in 20 VSA chapter one. And it might be helpful to take a look at the particular sections and subdivisions the secretary is calling out as containing those authorities. Just from the last few minutes of discussion, you might wanna take a look at, for example, uh, sections five and six, excuse me, subdivisions five and six in 20 VSA section nine, which is what the secretary was bringing up. Those deals with those deal with the governor using services and facilities of the state agencies. Um, and I would compare that to subdivision three that precedes it, where the General Assembly specifically called out licenses and the governor's authority to suspend statutory requirements around those licenses. What does that apply to? Strictly motor vehicles. There's a clause that calls out motor vehicle licenses right there in subdivision three. It would be incredibly curious to say that under subdivisions five and six, there is a uniform authority for suspension of requirements around licenses, but for some reason you had to call out motor vehicle licenses as a specific constraint in subdivision three. And again, the only reason I bring this up is that this is a potentially robust and tangled discussion. If it's something you want to dive into, you should take your time with it and make sure that you are paying very close attention to some of the constitutional arguments that are being made. So I don't, um, I, I don't think now is the time or place to have that robust constitutional argument. I'm not sure if you've had that. Um, and so all I'm saying, and I have been limiting myself to this language that was presented to me for comment um, I've given you um, the view of the administration that it is not necessary, but if you should decide that it is uh, something you would like to codify, um, I am suggesting that you take out under the office of the governor um, and just give him the authority to extend after consultation with the regulatory entity but give him the ultimate authority to extend those deadlines. That's all that I am, am suggesting. Um, I think that's a prudent um, recommendation. It leaves one person um, you know, with the authority in an emergency to make that call, but it does require that person to consult with the subject matter expert and in these cases is going to be the Secretary of State or the Commissioner of Health or others who um, are um, issuing those licenses. So you would take out the entire section that we put in on OPR? Well, I don't think it's necessary and I think it's confusing and it creates, um, I think just two two parallel universes or, or maybe more um, as to who, who can do that and how, is, how are they going to exercise that authority. Um, they don't have executive order authority. They don't, they are not able to issue declarations of an emergency. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess, you know, this is, this, is the, this is the legal construct that we've been working in since March when the first state of emergency order was issued. And we've been very careful and very mindful as we roll out iterations to consult with those who outside of a state of emergency have the authority that the governor is um, um, to exercise in the executive order and to seek you know, Secretary of State's approval uh, when we could. So, I, so I, think I guess we're never going to, I don't think we're ever going to agree on the scope of the governor's authorities, uh, you know, at some point in time, um, you know, they'll be tested and challenged, but I think that, uh, you know, the law provides for the authority that he has exercised, um, you know, in the law and the emergency powers laws in precedent. 
So I, I, I still believe that um, because the governor has no role in licensing under OPR at all, that the administration is never involved in that licensing, that that is that we need to give that authority to the director in consultation with the secretary of state, I believe is the way it's, or the director, this in consultation with the secretary of state is the ability for the director and the medical um, executive director of the medical board to act in lieu of their boards. Um, I, I think we need to give that authority to the director of OPR um, because that is, that's where, that's where the um, expertise is. They're the ones that do the licenses all the time. They are the ones who would know which licenses need to be extended and which don't. So I'm, I'm personally unwilling to take this OPR section out if the administration feels that you don't need to have that other ability, that you have that other ability for licenses, professional licenses that are under the governor's office, then we just don't need to put anything in there at all about that. The OPR will have the ability to do it for their licensees. And if the feeling is that it can be done by executive order for the other professions, then it can be done that way. Yeah, I would. I would just um, not to belabor a point, but but to have it in consultation with the professional licensing entity, um, <clears throat> in the language that I'm suggesting, would obviate the need to have a special statute for the Secretary of State, and would bring um, the Secretary of State's expertise into the conversation. Should a governor decide? to extend deadlines and um, other um, licensing requirements. I mean, so in consultation with the professional licensing entity would bring you the expertise that that other licensing entity, which might not, might not be directly in the governor's authority line outside of an emergency, it would bring that expertise to the governor um, prior to, you know, taking the action that's contemplated. So it's a different- I guess I don't understand here what the, what the issue is. We're saying that there's a declared emergency. The governor declares an emergency. What we're doing is saying, we don't now need to review all of those things. The, right. the governor doesn't need to review them and say, let's see, should we extend the licenses for nurses or should we not? The governor doesn't have to do that. We've given yep. the permission to, just like um, Secretary, you said that we we jumped in and helped out about open meetings. I, I don't think that that's entirely accurate. I think that we're the only ones that can do that. I don't think the governor has any ability, even in an emergency, to, um, to supersede the open meeting law. And it, was, it had to be worked out very carefully and because there are many players here and just issuing an executive order saying no more open meeting law. Well, that's, but, that, but that so certainly when, is not what would be contemplated. And no, I'm not no. suggesting we would say there's no more open meeting law, uh, Senator. Uh, you know, I believe in the open meeting and public records do. law as strongly as, as anybody on this committee. Um, what I'm suggesting is that if there needed to be a course correction or less frequent meetings uh, or whatever um, necessitated by the emergency, then he would arguably have that authority. But thankfully <laughs> you've stepped in and you've made that clear and that is one less thing on the plate. I'm not arguing um, with the wisdom of the Secretary of State by any means and his authority in this regard. And I respect you know, that office um, very highly. Oh, I'm just making a point that if you want consultation with the subject matter expert, it can be accomplished by putting that in the statute, which you have, and then removing under the office of the governor. And then the governor will consult with whoever is the head of the professional licensing entity before acting. Um, and that's prudent as well. But 
I don't believe we need the authority for the other offices. I don't think That's it's fine. necessary to include that in your bill. Um, okay. Clearly, you've got a different opinion on the Secretary of State, and uh, and we disagree. Um, and I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree uh, at this point. So you can move on with your your bill. But um, I, I. Any comment? Any other committee members, Allison? Well, you know, Suzanne, uh, I appreciate your input um, and a lot of. Uh, you've used the word, you know, how well we've worked together, how collaborative it's been. But I'm also envisioning a, a, a scenario where it might not be as collaborative, right. where people might not be uh, as uh, trusting of other people's expertise and other offices' expertise. And I, I, I think that we have to also think around those corners and think into what is best for enabling a state when you don't have time to roll out new executive orders every week and when you want things to go into play immediately. And um, this shortens the timeline for a lot of the things we now know need to, in certain circumstances, go into play. Right. And I, I think this liberates the governor's office to address the bigger things and and, uh, and other aspects of an emergency and really lets the functioning of government and, and, and the mechanisms of how we function go forward uh, in, in, a, in a constructive way. So I, I actually think they work together. And I also, you know, I'm concerned that sometimes we aren't always working as collaboratively and we want to have these go into play right away. I, sorry, did I say? Is no, I think okay? you're. I think you're right that the the point here is that once there was a declared emergency, there does, as Senator Clarkson said, there doesn't have to be an executive. The, the governor's office doesn't have to think. Who? What do we have to do? These go into effect, right? When there's a declared emergency, and um, that the, that's what we're trying to do, so that we don't have to spend two months scrambling and the governor trying to put out executive orders all the time to deal with other situations. We're trying to take the situations that we learned from this and let them immediately go into play when there's a declared emergency. That's, that's the only thing that we're doing here is um, trying to uh, allow as Senator Clarkson said, the functioning of government to go forward without having to spend a lot of time um, trying to figure out once again, how to allow that functioning to go forward. Right. We don't so. want to reinvent the wheel all the time. <laughs> right. We have a hard enough time reinventing it <laughs> or inventing it once. Right. We're this capitalizing on this moment. <laughs> Chris, anyway. well, and the other thing, just to be careful, is that you know we weren't impugning anyone, either this right. legislature or this governor or any future one. But we, we had a discussion the other day about there, there. You know, we all believe in Vermont exceptionalism, but right. um, I, you know, I'm guessing in Wisconsin they felt that there was Wisconsin exceptionalism or other states, you know, where they where an administration and a legislature found themselves at loggerheads. And they wouldn't have imagined that happening. So I think we're, we're actually just trying to be cautious that we would set up something that um, would help navigate, help the entire state navigate, even if we didn't have um, folks necessarily quite so inclined as we've been in this emergency to pulling together and working really well, that's all. So I think we're trying to be cautious. So, committee, where are we? I, I understand, oh. uh, Secretary, if you feel we don't need to put in this the ability for to extend licenses, um, we're I don't we're not we don't want to put anything in here that you don't want. So, if you don't feel that you need that um, provision, that it can be done just by an executive order, then. Um, We'll just leave that out. I feel very strongly about leaving in the OPR 
I don't know where the rest of the committee is on that at all. Uh, I do too, because I think, again, licensing, I mean, a lot of these things are part of just functionality and, and yeah, I, 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 I don't see a reason not to keep it in. Any other committee member, Brian? Yeah, I must confess, um, I thought we were gonna like do a really good thing and now I'm, I'm feeling like there's some constitutional toes that are being stepped on in some fashion. Um, and, I'm, and I'm confused because I don't know what the right answer is. I'm not a constitutional scholar, so I don't know. I trust uh, Tucker and Betsy to Ann to kind of guide us in the, in the proper direction, but I'm also sensitive to a secretary of young position that it may not be needed in some cases. I guess maybe I would ask her, is there anything in the bill that we do need to keep in because it wouldn't otherwise adversely affect what could be done in an executive order? I don't think I asked that very well, but I'm, I'm just trying to weigh where we are. So we'll have to take a look at the entire bill. Um, I apologize, Senator, when I was asked uh, to come in, I only had the one section um, of a larger, clearly a larger bill in front of me. And uh, so we'll, we'll take a look at the bill. Um, Betsy Ann? Yes. And, hey, and, and just to give some background, uh, the reason why the, if the committee recalls, the reason why you wanted to pursue potential professional licensing issues is because um, the Department of Public Safety had specifically requested the General Assembly extend the electricians and plumbers licenses mm -hmm. um, in Act, what became Act 100. And so that's where the original language came from. It was Act 100, Section 4, where pursuant to Department of Public Safety request, um, the General Assembly extended electricians and plumbers licenses that were due to expire between March 30th and September 20th. You deem them valid so that they're, they would expire on September 30th of this year. So there was a specific request from the administration to extend those professional licenses. And then the committee asked that um, to do, to uh, have language to do the same thing for the off the shelf bill for applicable professional licenses. Yeah, that, that's a good reminder that that is where that the request came from the administration to begin with. And I appreciate that. And, you know, that one could, I, I, one could argue that was a, out of an abundance of caution. I'm not saying that was the wrong thing to do. Um, we're just really talking about what is necessary and what is not. And, you know, the committee acted on, on that request. Um, and that's great. Uh, I'm just trying to really carefully think about uh, the governor, uh, what it means to be a governor, not just this governor, but a governor in a state of emergency. Um, and uh, that, you know, there are provisions in the law that suggest that may not have been necessary, but we're happy that you did it, um, or in that this provision um, is not necessary. And I appreciate the fact that you're going to leave it out. Um, and we can argue, you know, uh, someday in front of a court, maybe <laughs> whether it was necessary or not, if challenged, but um, that's our current, uh, that's, that is our current interpretation of a governor's, a governor's emergency authorities. Someone has to be in charge. There are checks and balances. Um, but at the end of the day, someone's got to make the ultimate decision. And um, so that's. I, I, I would, I, I think in January, I would love to have the conversation about the constitutional issues with um, uh, Betsy Ann and Tucker and maybe Peter Teachout and some other people around. When can a governor suspend statute? And what statute can be suspended? Is it any, any, anything that's in statute during a 
a state of emergency that the governor can simply suspend? I, I don't I don't know, but I'd like to have I think that in January that would be a great discussion to have around what what that means. And does it mean that during a state of emergency, the entire green books right are are, are, are gone. Right, our, our you, you should have lots of precedent by then from other states. I mean, there have been, you know, a lot, everyone's in a state of emergency, I believe, and there have been challenges across the country and maybe we'll have a richer body of law to inform us, uh, you know, next session. Well, but our, our constitution is very different than many states' constitutions. And um, so I, I think yeah. that, uh, in, we could, if we if we think that the governor has authority completely to suspend statute, it it could. And and I'm not talking about this governor. I'm not talking about. And I'm not talking about anybody that's in my mind that could be a governor. But we could have we could have a very authoritarian governor declare a state of emergency and simply suspend all the statutes in but, but uh, we give which which would know, be it, quickly challenged i'm sure <laughs> so. yeah, but we 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 give the governor those executive order yes up in our i mean we have given those to the governor uh it, it maybe it it you know after this pandemic is done that's a section of of law we have not necessarily looked at recently maybe we right. should be reviewing uh 20 uh, VSA. Is that right, Tucker? It's t Title 20. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, I mean, maybe maybe this is an opportunity for us to review those together. Also, the governor's office with its, you know, experience now having gone through this huge emergency and, and lengthy emergency, um, they would have input also as to how to beef it up or or, or not, but it's a, you know, clearly, it's not, to me, this isn't a constitutional issue. I mean, it seems like we've given that authority that we're discussing, we've given that to the governor's office and it's not like it was in the constitution. Well, well, I think what's in the constitution is what, that we have the authority and we right. can give it to the, we can give certain authorities to the governor or right. to, or to the Secretary of State, or, I mean, we gave, we've given the, we don't um, have saddlebags full of votes anymore that we count. We've given that authority to the Secretary of State's office as an efficiency, uh, it's a functioning of the government. So we don't do that anymore. We've given that authority there. We haven't given, we haven't given all authority to any um, office. And I guess the question is, what are the limits to that? I mean, and that's what we can review at some yeah. point when we do 20DSA. Yeah, I think this will be a great conversation. Yeah, we, all have, we all have to agree to stick around for it. Yeah. yeah. I think the con constitutional issues are important and obviously interesting. It would yeah. make for a good discussion. But I just think there's two practical things I keep coming back to. One is that I thought part of what we were doing was trying to make things be more efficient in the, in the mm -hmm. future, should there be a similar situation. Because as you mentioned, Jeanette, a lot of people came to our committee and said, you know, we need we need you to take a look at this, whether it's you know holding meetings, open meetings, whatever it might be, different powers of local communities, and they needed those to be discussed, and be, they needed the authority or the go ahead from the legislature to make the changes. The governor obviously signed these things into law, so at the time, sort of must have agreed with the idea that it was appropriate for the legislature to be doing it. The other thing I think, you know, it's, it is important. And I, I, you said this as well, you've both, all of us said this, but we're not, right now we're talking about a particular governor in a particular state of mind in a particular with the relationship with the legislature and all, everything was very smooth and the governor did a great job of making sure things stayed smooth. And I appreciate that, but we're not talking about this governor, you know, we're talking about what may come in the future and we don't know what may come in the future. And I think in the future, we have to be prepared that, we may have a different governor with a different point of view, maybe a different ability right. to move forward. And, you know, we may find ourselves really wishing we had, or I think we'll be, we, we find ourselves appreciating the fact that we have in statute 
what would happen in certain areas if the governor declares an emergency. emergency. Emergency declaration means A, B, and C, and D can begin to happen right away without having the legislature have to go over these things again and take the time and energy necessary to rethink them. So I think you know it's, it's hard to base it on, on this experience because this experience was pretty good, although it was pretty good in the sense that we also spent a lot of time wading through these issues but it may not be so good in the future. So we have to be prepared for, we have certainly, to be prepared for the worst and do the best or something like that. Certainly appreciate that, Senator, because you know it could be all changed in the future. I think it's worth having um, revisitiveness outside of the emergency, um, you know, lessons learned and looking back and, and really do appreciate the work that you've put and the thought that you've put into um, these issues. So certainly don't want to minimize that. Um, at all, and um, it's it's value. Uh, it's just really a question of you know necessity. And I I understand the argument we could have in the future a governor that we wouldn't trust with this authority and need some check and statute, or we could have a secretary of state we don't trust in this. You know, I mean, it could it, the shoe fits on, on everybody's foot at some mm. point here in the conversation. So certainly do appreciate the fact that. Um, things could change in many different ways um, in the future uh, without whoever's in office in whatever office. Okay, so committee, where are we? Um, I think that we're going to lose a couple people. Yeah, I, I like. Thank I you, Secretary Young. Um, I think we should also Thank be you, careful about the special powers delegated to the chair of government operations so we haven't <laughs> talked about that much yet um, it's a little awkward to bring up but i think we're gonna have to um, oh okay betsy ann have you got that language i asked you to draft <laughs> <laughs> so i think we're am i correct here or is that tomorrow we're losing people i have no, to go right now anthony's leaving and I have to leave in five minutes sadly okay is that that's today right that is today that, this okay. is now. <laughs> that's okay cool. so I would suggest that we um review that we have a new draft tomorrow that we review it and then we have the discussion about where we want to go um and we'll leave out the um the section giving the governor the authority to um uh extend licenses in the executive branch. My feeling is that we leave in the OPR language. Yes, I agree. Yeah. yeah. And OK. And, um, and then we'll have some more language around the municipal elections. And the um, there were some other suggestions that were made today. And we come back. And tomorrow is Wednesday, so as much as possible. And I don't know if it's possible Betsy Ann and Tucker to try to um, put it together into one thing so that we can have a review of it tomorrow. Is you mean it, it, have them collaborate and unite? <laughs> Does that work? Okay. And if there are, <coughs> and then, so it'll be pretty, pretty firm at that point and we'll just take general comments. And if there are any press people that want to come and look at what we've done around open meetings or anything else, we'll take some comments on it. But it'll be pretty much, pretty much a finished bill tomorrow. We hope. That's and then, Madam Chair, did we uh, will OPR and Board of Medical Practice be able to come in tomorrow to testify on the remainder of these sections, which are we're just piggybacking off of Act ninety one. Yeah, if they if they want to, I think that they um, uh, Chris Winter sent a, a note that said that he could he had to leave and that um, OPR was okay with the changes, but but we'll we'll notify we'll notify everybody the league the uh, clerks the OPR Secretary of State the press who else needs to. Um, that's pretty much it, isn't it? 
<laughs> so. Oh, and, and and do notify. Uh, um, we'll notify David Hurley. He also because just to make sure that that's. Um, anybody else? Okay. Thank Great. you. Thank you. That was very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. I, it reminds um, me why I'm glad I'm on this committee. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Bye.